It is finally here, your advanced look at the House of M Omnibus from Marvel Comics. So, let's get started. Before getting started, I want to give a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and book market on January 10th or 11th, depending on where you get your books. And speaking of direct market, book market, what we're looking at here is the standard edition cover by Olivia Coipel, who is the main artist on the House of M miniseries. On the left-hand side is your direct market cover. That one is supplied by Ezat Ribich. Now, there are different spines. I do like the fact that one of them is Professor X and the other one is Magneto because those are kind of the big key players as to House of M. But everything else is identical, so let's shift the focus back to this. So here we have the House of M logo, the cover, this widescreen cover featuring the key players, Bendis, Quapel, a uh, little blurb there from Newsarama. Marvel Omnibus, House of M, Bendis, Quapel, and then Magneto again. If you have the direct market, you have the Professor X down there. And then this image from Joe Quesada. The book ISBN is $125. What is collected in this book? And the Scarlet Witch reshapes the world. All right. Now, when I'm going to talk about this book, I do have to talk about some things that happened before this. As a matter of fact, right now, what I'm going to suggest is, before even opening this up, I don't care if you know the three words that are uttered here, because they're everywhere on the internet, I swear. People that don't even read comics know those three words, but I'm not going to talk about that. Before reading any of this in here, I do have some strong suggested reading. Number one, Avengers Disassembled. At the very least, you have to read this before you read this. The cliffhanger here leads directly into this book, even though it's six months later, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Astonishing X-Men. Now, I'm not telling you to read the whole omnibus, but at the very least, read the first six issues. That gives you the new status quo of X-Men. That gives you the characters that are going to be playing a key part in this book. So, at the very least, read the first six issues of that, all of Avengers Assembled, and if you want to, the first ten issues of New Avengers. This happens after the events of Avengers Disassembled, and it gives us the new team. So the team that you see here are going to be involved here, and the team that you see in Astonishing X-Men will be involved here. As a matter of fact, this originally started as an Astonishing X-Men New Avengers crossover, and then they decided to just expand it across the Marvel Universe. Now, the stories collected in this omnibus have been collected before, in trade paperbacks and single issues, of course, and in an oversized hardcover formats. Uh, but this is the first time we've had House of M fully collected in omnibus format. So let's take a look at it underneath the dust jacket. So here is the House of M. We're about to find out exactly what that is when I crack this book open. So very, very, very important. I do have to talk about, not in detail, of course, the events that happen in Avengers. There's a symbol. I do have to talk about the powers of the Scarlet Witch. I'm not going to talk about the Decimation Era or those three words that she utters, even though I think 99% of you watching this video probably already know what that is. But I am going to talk about the first three issues here, kind of what sets up the House of M, and then we'll talk about the miniseries. But just in case, there are going to be some spoilers about Avengers Disassembled and a few of the issues of New Avengers and some astonishing X-Men, just to kind of give you an idea of where the mutants are at the beginning of the story. So, all right, let's crack it open and get started. All right, let's crack this open. I love that this is on red. It's beautiful. I like that. I like that they're trying out new things underneath the dust jacket, red, and paper, of course. Here are the key players of the House of M. We're about to find out what that is. House of M... And then the mini series, and of course the main event there, and the creators behind each one. So you have like Mark Wade and Tom Payer writing the House of M Spider Man, Salvador La Roca doing the artwork. But the main mini series, the eight issue mini series, Brian Michael Bendis, Olivia Coipel, Tim Townsend supplying the inks, and Frank Damarda doing the colors. Uh, but then you have like the single issue of New Thunderbolts, Black Panther, Uncanny X Man by Claremont, and Chris Bachel. And Alan Davis, Wolverine there by Daniel Way, and then 
Mark Texheria coming back uh, to do in some of the... Well, I think it's actually... He does it under the breakdowns of Javier Salatares. And then we have all the other stuff, including Decimation. Now, I'm going to flip through some of the artwork in Decimation so you can see what it is. But I'm not going to go into details about it because that is in the aftermath of House of M. And I'm going to be talking enough about spoilers so you don't want to know what happens afterward or how this gets resolved. If you do want to hear my thoughts on that, then I may come back and revisit this and actually do a read review of this book. But first, let's talk about this, what it collects. So this collects House of M 1 through 8, Spider-Man House of M 1 through 5, Fantastic Four House of M 1 through 3, Iron Man House of M uh, the three issue miniseries, New Thunderbolts 11, Black Panther number 7, Uncanny X Men 462 to 465, Wolverine, the 2003 series, not the classic Wolverine series, 33 to 35, Captain America number 10, that's the 2004 series, uh, Cable and Deadpool number 17, Incredible Hulk 83 to 87. I'll just put the in the description of the video what the contents are to make it easier so you can see the years too. Uh, New X-Men 16 through 19, Exile 69 through 71, Mutopia X 1 through 5, Decimation, House of M the Day After, Giant Size Miss Marvel number 1, Secrets of House of M, Pulse, House of M Special, House of M Director's Cut, and House of M Sketchbook. And then material from Broken Worlds Book 1, which I love the way that they put it in this book. Alright, let's go back to the beginning. So it all kicks off six months after the events of Avengers Disassembled. And really quickly, what had happened in Avengers Disassembled is Scarlet Witch has betrayed the Avengers. She points the fingers at the Avengers for making her forget about her kids. Now, if you're a long-time reader, that was never explained. It was never explained how she forgot about her kids again, but hey, whatever. Uh, nor has it been explained how she got so powerful. Just kind of happened. Because if one thing about the Scarlet Witch is she was always this character that had chaos magic. Well, that's during Engelhart's run, really. But she had the probability, manipulation. But this is world-altering powers that she's about to do. Now, she's never been that powerful. And characters do change from time to time. Uh, but there was never a story, is what my point is, that said, All right, Scarlet Witch under Agatha Harkness, under Thawne. Under all these demons that taught her the chaos magic, now she can do some world-altering manipulation. That's a big step, but that story never came about. Later on, it was a little bit of a retcon uh, in Children's Crusade, uh, but not fully explaining exactly how she got so powerful. So this does have everything to do with her kids. She's waking up, uh, remembering giving birth to them. Dr. Stephen Strange is there. You have Daredevil with Elektra. Her father... Right there, Magneto and Quicksilver, her brother, and of course, Vision, her husband. It's a beautiful moment. And then in rolls in Professor X saying, whoa, what are you doing, Wanda? This has to stop. And she's like, no, you can't take them away from me. And he's like, you got to put it back. So really quickly gives you a quick, quick, like what happened previously. So at the end of Avengers Disassembled, we had Magneto come in and saying, give me my daughter. And he takes her over to Genosha. Now, this is after the events of Grant Morrison's New X-Men, where Genosha was destroyed, right? Like, so many mutants died and some, and, and some humans, too, including some that are related to our X-Men. And now it's just left in shambles. But that's where Professor X and Magneto have been hanging out, trying to rebuild this world or this Genosha. Now, he takes her over there in the hopes of healing his daughter because he sees what she's done to the Avengers, betrayed them, killed some of them. Not going into detail as to who, but it becomes such a hard thing. Professor X states that it's getting really hard to keep tabs on her. Her powers are becoming stronger. She's really starting to believe that this is the real world, that the, where her two children are. Now... What Professor X does is assemble a gathering of Avengers and X-Men to talk about the future of Scarlet Witch. And it is a very difficult conversation because they are talking about what to do with her. And one of the choices is killing her, which is a very messed up thing to talk about because, you know, this is a friend to a lot of these characters. Uh, this is a family member to Quicksilver, and Quicksilver, as a matter of fact, is here begging his father to stop them, you know, and he's like, hey, they're gonna kill her, you have to stop this, and 
Magneto's like, what will you have me do? Do you want me to kill a bunch of uh, superheroes to make your sister live? We have to stop this somehow. So they're really at wit's end. As a matter of fact, there's a scene here where Cyclops is like, Professor X, you're, you know, you've always been about life. You've always forgiven those who've harmed us and let them live. And I thought it was an awesome scene right here where Professor X is looking up at Cyclops and he's like, I don't know what to do. So he's lost. So they gather together and they head to Genosha where they can't find Scarlet Witch. And then a big yellow light appears as each character starts to disappear. The light gets bigger. It's like giving birth to a whole new world. Now Peter Parker is waking up next to his bride. You notice she's got blonde hair instead of red hair. And it is Gwen Stacy that he's married to. So that's the end of the first issue. Like I said, I'm only going to talk about the first three issues because that really sets up what the premise of this is. So in issue two, we see a whole new world. We see Steve Rogers never became Captain America. He fought in World War II. Uh, he's an old man now. We see Dazzler actually being a, a host of her own show and being really successful at that, as well as Simon Williams. This is Wonder Man being a movie star. Cyclops is with Emma Frost. So it's like everybody, uh, Miss Marvel, Captain Marvel rather, is the most popular superhero in this world. So it's almost like everybody got their wish that they became the best versions of themselves. Well, I say almost everybody, but there's Remy LeBeau right there, Gambit, just a thief. Kitty Pride is teaching class. We have the remains of Sentinels, but they look a little bit different. Uh, we have Luke Cage. We have Sam Wilson, who's a detective. Uh, this right here is Robert, uh, who's a character, of course, the Sentry. He's being he's visiting Doctor Strange, and he's having memories of his family. A Colossus plowing the fields out there. Hank McCoy doing some experimental things for Tony Stark. Janet, the Wasp, is now just making clothes. Like, so she owns her own clothing line and designing clothes. You have Aurora being the queen of Wakanda. Now, it feels like the whole world is different, and that's the premise of this. However, Wolverine wakes up one day. He's sitting next to this redhead, and it turns out to be Mystique. They've been together, and he's having flashbacks of the Weapon X project. And he's realizing that something isn't right because it doesn't make any sense. He doesn't know what he's doing here. He doesn't recognize uh, these people. Well, he recognizes the people, but he doesn't recognize what they're wearing, what he's doing. And they're all wearing these shield type of armors. That's Jessica Drew and Toad right there. And he wakes up and he is sitting on a helicarrier. But it's not your shield helicarrier. It's more of the House of M helicarrier. You have the House of M Sentinels and the fleet. So what exactly is the House of M? And that is the House of Magnus. Because in this world, mutants are the dominating species. They're the ones that are in charge of everything. They're the entertainers. They're the most popular. They're the most beloved. Um, and humans, they're not slaves to, to, to the mutants. But they're not up there as far as the hierarchy of species on this planet. So Wolverine, again, is having flashbacks of his life. In the 616 universe, the what we call the real Marvel universe. And he doesn't recognize anything. So he just jumps off the helicarrier, decides to drop. Yeah, he just decides to drop because he knows he's going to live. He thinks that something's going on. Somebody's possessing his mind. Uh, so the S.H.I.E.L.D. people, they go after him. Like his own friends go after him. It's really cool that they have this in between the issue. Uh, you have the whole Pulse issue later on. But yeah, Wolverine wakes up. Now he's starting to remember everything. He tries to go and see where Professor X is. Turns out he's not living at the mansion. What exactly is happening? His own friends are coming after him. Again, these are S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, characters that work for the House of Magnus. They're all hunting him down. He escapes, only to be met by Cloak. Now, Cloak takes him somewhere that is, is a secret organization. And this is where he takes him where Luke Cage and friends are hanging out. And all of these people have been awakened by one character, and that is this little girl named Layla Miller. And Layla Miller, she's kind of your MacGuffin here. She remembers the way the world is supposed to be. You don't really explain what her powers are. She just is waking up these characters one by one, remembering their real life, that this is not the world 
that they live in. This is not the real world. That they belong in the 616 universe. So they gather a force to take down the House of Magnus because they figure, okay, Magneto is behind everything. He's the one that manipulated Scarlet Witch to make this world in his image. We have to put a stop to it. So together they build an alliance to go and stop Magneto with Layla Miller at the helm, waking people up left and right, uh, including people like Spider-Man and, of course, Emma Frost. And that's all I will say about what the House of M is. And that's literally the first, actually, four issues. Sorry about that. A little bit of four in there. Uh, you can find out exactly what happens. Uh, and, of course, those famous three little words. But that is the premise. And this is the beautiful artwork by Olivier Coipel. Just reimagining these heroes in this particular world. Now we move on to the miniseries. Because that is how this is mapped. All eight issues of House of M are there. And then we get the miniseries and the tie-ins. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Actually, I'll talk about it now. So this is Spider-Man, for example. This is House of M, Spider-Man, written by Mark Wade, Tom Payer, and Salvador La Roca doing the artwork. And Spider-Man's a big hero here. And he's married to Gwen Stacy. They have a kid. Uncle Ben's alive. His life is perfect. However, he holds a secret that will forever change the way that people feel about him and see him. So he has to keep that quiet. It's a five-issue miniseries. It's actually a really good story. I really enjoy this. It's very underrated. Nobody really talks about this. Uh, I love the relationship between him and Gwen. I love his secret, the little twist, and how it ties everything together. Uh, I'm going to say something, though. It felt like the editors of House of M approached Mark Wade and said, Hey, Spider-Man's going to be in this universe. Write a miniseries about Spider-Man in an alternate universe. So Mark Wade and Tom Perry got together and were like, okay, yeah, we got it. We know what we're going to write. The character you're reading about in this miniseries feels so different than the character you're going to read in the eight-issue House of M series. So much so that it doesn't make any sense when you get to the ending of this than when the character is approached in House of M. Because what? When? It really doesn't make any sense. So it felt like the editors kind of didn't tell Mark Wade what the end game was to House of M. And I'm not saying it's a bad series, but I'm saying that because a lot of the miniseries feel like that. Uh, the next one we're going to be talking about, but before we get to the next miniseries, we have to talk about Thunderbolts 11, which is really a story about Captain Marvel. Which Captain Marvel? Well, you can find out for yourself. But the next big story is the House of M Fantastic Four. Uh, this is the world where Doctor Doom has formed the Fantastic Four. But it's not the Fantastic Four as we know them. It's more like the Fearsome Four. Like one of the four members is this creature known as It. And he has a really beautiful story. And I kind of wanted more of that character. Uh, then you get the Uncanny X-Men issues. Which is pretty much Captain Britain being reimagined for this House of M. He's uh, kind of like royalty in the United Kingdom. But it's got less to do with House of M and more with, like, multiverse hopping. There's a story that focuses on uh, Rachel and Psylocke in here. And Alan Davis and Chris Bacciolo supplying the artwork for these. My point is, whenever doing overviews of books that have a big event and a big crossover, you know, I like to map things out in my head. I'm like, okay, I think this issue would have been great in here. Um... For, for example, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the way that Infinite Crisis is mapped. I think that is mapped to perfection. Or the way that the upcoming Spider-Verse is mapped. That took a lot of love and care. Um, or the Ven Omnibus by Donny Cates. But not so much like the King in Black. Because I think King in Black would have benefited from some issues of Venom. So, with this, I think this is mapped the only way that you could have mapped this. Yes, you could have added, sure, those issues of Fantastic Four in there. Uh, in between uh, maybe issues five and six, but it really would have taken from the story. Like this story right here with Wolverine, it really focuses more on Mystique and their relationship during the House of M. So where in the world would you have fit this if Wolverine immediately remembers things in issue number two? Because this almost works like a prelude to House of M. So it's just set in the world of House of M. Uh, this is the Tony Stark story right here by Greg Pak and drawn by Pat Lee, who at the time was drawing giant robots, building his own studio in Dreamwave Studios. And again, this one doesn't really feel like it would fit into in between any issue. 
because this is all about Tony Stark and how he feels about handing over technology for the House of Magnus and what they're doing to oppress humans. So it's that type of story. Then the Cable and Deadpool story, which is really good, by the way. Can't wait for that reprint and for you all to read it for the first time. The focus is on Sinister, his relations to uh, Cable and Deadpool, or Cable rather, in the Summers line. This is one of my favorite stories in here. But again, do you really want to read the Hulk hanging out in Australia finding peace only to be interrupted by AIM agents and House of M agents in between issues 7 and 8? No, you don't. You would want to read it at some point, of course, because if you're a completist like me, you want to read the entire thing, but it makes sense to separate it from everything else. It's not like... Iron Man House of M leads into this. Uh, this is written by Peter David, Jorge Lucas, doing the artwork. And the thing that I appreciated that they did here is in between is that in between issues 85 and 87 is where they put Hulk Broken Worlds Book 1. Now, it's not, you know, it's material from it, but I love the fact that they added it there. So there was, you know, some thought into putting this together. I think... They made the right decision by everything being in the back. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions. This is the new X-Men story again. Not a miniseries, but altering the title to fit into this House of M story arc that's going on throughout the entire Marvel Universe. Um, the thing that I would have added would, would have been like the giant size Miss Marvel. I think that would have been good to add before reading, for example, Exiles. Because Exiles... We're visiting the world of House of M, and I love Exiles, and it gives me hope one day we're going to have an actual Omnibus of the Exiles. Such an underrated gem. Speaking of underrated gems, this is uh, Mutopia X. This is what became of District X. The series that David Hine was writing became Mutopia X in this House of M world. And it does feature some of the characters that you would have seen on that title, like Bishop. Now, after the Mutopia X miniseries is where you will find the day after. I just wanted to show a little bit of Randy Green's artwork, but I can't show a lot. And that's the aftermath of House of M. That deals with how everyone is going to cope with the three words and what happens to humanity, what happens to mutants, what exactly is going on. And it's a very well-written one-shot. Um, and this is where you will find Giant Size Miss Marvel... Uh, and I know it was written after House of M, but I thought it was such an interesting story that it could have fit in before, for example, the House of M aftermath. Uh, here's the pulse, and the pulse is cool, but again, I don't think it would have fit in between issues because do you really want to read newspaper articles and ads while Wolverine is gathering his forces with Luke Cage? Probably not. It would break the momentum of that story so bad that, yeah, you would be like, okay, I'm done reading this. I'm, I'll come back to it. And I feel like it really belongs back here. This is The Secrets of House of M, which kind of works like a handbook of the House of M, giving you the status quo of where the characters are. There are some spoilers for things, so I would read this after reading the eight-issue series, just in case. Because uh, I know some people like to go in there and read the handbook. Uh, before reading the series, but there are some spoilers that you don't learn until like issues five and six through here that they talk about in the handbook. And then we have the variants. So let's look at those. We have this one right here, of course, the Olivia Coapel variant. Love that Joe Casada variant to issue number one. And we didn't really have a lot of variants back then. You know, this this I remember this did a lot for the comic industry. Uh, despite of people's feelings about the story, it really brought back that idea of, hey, crossover sell. So every year after this, we would have something, whether it was Civil War, Secret Invasion, uh, you know, even crossovers between titles. The crossovers were back because they were gone for a long time just because of the state of the comic book industry. Uh, but because they had relaunched New Avengers, they had given us a new status quo for X-Men, Maybe it was time to bring it back, and they did. And they are still here to this day because of this. And also the variants. They brought back variants in a big way. Like, having three variants for the first issue... I think this is a Wizard World exclusive, if I'm not mistaken. But having three variants for the first issue was a huge deal. Now, you know, left and right, comics have 15 variants, 30 variants. I think the Gargoyles at Dynamite has, like, 
20, 30 variants, something like that. Here's some original artwork before it inks, before the colors, just to show you the talents behind here. Olivier Coipel, my goodness, he his art is amazing. Big fan of his art. Here's a sketchbook, interior pencils, thumbnail sketches, more Olivier Coipel mixed in with some Alan Davis there, Adam Kubert, designs here by Pat Lee. Scott Eaton drawing the Fantastic Four, or I guess the Fearsome Four. Pulse hardcover pencils by Mike Mayhew. Exiles pages. This is a big book. Speaking of, let's take a look at this binding. So it is sewn binding. This one printed at the Donley printer. Holy crap, that's an eye. 1,368 pages. Um, and again, printed at the Donley printer. As far as the paper quality, it feels like it, it's got a different finish to it, the glossy finish, than the glossy paper at the iMac printer. But honestly, it feels almost as thin as the latest book from the iMac printer that The Astonishing Melanie and I did, which is the Spider-Man by Nick Spencer Volume 1 Omnibus. That's what it feels like. And that overview will come out later this afternoon, if I'm filming these in the right order. But that's it. That, as they say, is that. No more overview. See what I did there? If you're interested in purchasing this book, don't forget to check out our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, emails answered within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first-time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this omnibus. Let me know in the comments down below if you are picking this up, if you have the trades, if you have the oversized hardcovers, if you are going to upgrade to this omnibus, and what else would you like to see collected from this era in omnibus format? Again, this was the Uncanny Omar, and if you have any questions, leave them down below. Smash that like button, please. That goes a long way for our channel. Check out our Patreon. Check out our spread shop. Links are in the description of the video. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.